Love will keep us together. What am I talking about? You're having coffee with Conrad. Conrad rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is Conrad from ConradRocks.net. Rocks of revelation being poured out. My passion is for you to have a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, I seem to always be podcasting about having that spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus, and today will be no exception. Now, I recently ran across a Facebook post by a friend of mine, and they got really attacked by another Christian with an argument that was totally out of left field, and it wasn't really relevant to the topic. It was basically divisive, and just throwing rocks for the sake of doing it. Now, we see this happen quite a bit on social media, and I suspect that that's one reason a lot of people I meet out and about that won't friend me on Facebook, they say, oh, I've had enough of Facebook, all that garbage on there. You know who I'm talking about, right? They had a bad experience on Facebook, and they don't know things about unfollowing or or whatever. And I have to chuckle a little bit because there's this huge parallel of people out in the marketplace that talk about church hurt. Oh, I'm never going back into a church building. This happened to me, this happened to me, this happened to me. So, I begin to wonder if people just start making a profession out of being offended. What's that all about? Offenses must come, but woe to them that that they come from, right? We've got to be a little bit more thick-skinned than that if we're going to make disciples of all nations. If we're going to preach the gospel to every creature, as as Jesus says to in, in Mark 16, we're going to need a little bit more thick skin. Now, Jesus prayed for the people as they were driving stakes into his hands. Remember, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stephen prayed for the people that were stoning him to death. Lay not this sin to their charge. So Jesus tells us to pray for those that despiteful use us and persecute. When you're supposed to bless them and curse them not. So these are the biblical paradigms. Now, I also believe that we need to understand that the body of Christ, you know, a house divided cannot stand. Sixth graders are not mad at first graders for being in the first grade. As we keep seeking Jesus and traversing the way, of course our theology will improve just because we're continuing in the word of Jesus. We're going to know a little bit more about theology than the first graders. And this gives us absolutely no right to attack others that aren't where we are. And we need to be humble in this because we could still be wrong. Okay, a lot of us are set in our thinking. I'm always talking about blasting paradigms. I'm going to reemphasize the fact that the top theologians of the day crucified Jesus. I mean, look at how seriously wrong they were in their theology. Saul was a top theologian sitting at the feet of Gamaliel, and he was killing Christians using the word of God to do so, thinking he was doing God a service. Then in Acts chapter 9, we notice that Paul was knocked down. His pride was changed. He was knocked down to the dust of the earth. And then he realized that his previous paradigm was incorrect. He was attacking Christians. Remember? Remember when Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute me? Well, Saul was attacking Christians. So one thing that we can learn, that when we attack other Christians, we are attacking Jesus. 
So, you know, one of the things we're supposed to do is edify, build up, and exhort. If you look at the Greek, I was looking at the Greek of the word exhort one time. I don't have the Bible in front of me right now, but it means to call to one side. It's something that you do privately. So if you disagree with someone, you don't do it wide out and open on Facebook. You'd probably want to do it privately and in love, right? You don't want to tear down somebody else in front of others. Um, and you got to ask yourself, what's the motivation for me wanting to do that? What, you know, as Peter said, should we call down fire from heaven for these and kill these people that disagree with us? Jesus says, you don't know what spirit you're of. So we need to ask ourselves, what spirit is that of? Amen. Now, Stephen Barrett from Holy Fire Japan said something really interesting about evangelism on the Voxer Christian chat the other day. We were talking about the difference between evangelizing in America and in Japan, some of the paradigm differences. And one of the things that he highlighted that really stuck with me is that love keeps the body together. This reminded me of a conversation or a teaching I was listening to by Sylvia Schaefer a long time ago. We were in some type of a group meeting, but what she said was more important than where we were or when we were. She said there's a difference between sowing love into someone's life compared to that of handing out a Bible tract. And I've often thought about that. I've, I've couched that in the back of my mind. I'm thinking, you know, faith works by love. God is love. And people want to know that you care and that you're showing them love of Christ. If you do that, they're many times more likely to stick with you than if you simply hand them an intellectual argument framed in a Bible tract. Christianity has somehow been reduced to winning an intellectual argument or a debate. Now, have you noticed that? I mean, have you noticed that? We only care about being right. If we can somehow get a person to say the sinner's prayer, then we've won our theological argument, and we can leave them and go start another one with someone else. I'm not saying everybody does that, but this is a huge paradigm in the body. And I do not think that that is what Jesus meant when he said, make disciples. So as we're building this honeycomb of the kingdom of God, and I, I you know, the six-sided, uh, you know, the six is number of man, we've got to build God's kingdom on earth, right? And I think honey has a lot to do with it. You know, something sweet uh, to the taste. The rabbis, I read somewhere, they would put a little drop of honey on the scroll and get the kids to kiss it, and they would taste that the word of God was good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So the, the children would actually go, you know what? I, I want to equate the word of God with honey. The kingdom of God has to be savored and sweet to the taste. This way it gets in our in our mouth, in our head, it drops down in our heart. And then when we go through those trials, you know, we're able to go through it because we have the word of God. We know what to do. And then, you know, as both John the Revelator and Ezekiel said, hey, you know what, it was, it was good in my mouth, it tasted sweet like honey, but now it's in my belly, and it's a little bitter. Well, the Word of God will help us get through those bitter trials so that we can help others. Now, this makes me think, you know, if we know the Word of God, we know the precepts of Christ, When we go through trials or we see someone else go through a trial, how do we really act when the rubber hits the road? There's this one friend on Facebook. He was going through a medical procedure that, that, you know, cost him some money. His electricity went out in his house, and he was several states away, and it was freezing. It's wintertime. And he simply said, look, I need a place to stay for a couple of days till they turn on my electricity, and I'm, you know, I'm getting out of the hospital today, and, and no one took him in. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, lots of people know this person on, on social media. And I, it, it caused me to, to take a real serious pause. This seems to be another symptom of what's really going on in the body of Christ. In general, we're not truly loving each other in action, 
You know, it might be lip service, but is Jesus our Lord? Jesus said, the love of many will wax cold because iniquity shall abound in Matthew 24, and we're definitely seeing that happen today. But um, in reality, you know, I'm, I'm looking at things uh, through social media and also out and about when we're ministering out in the flea markets, you know, out in public and so forth. It seems like people are more interested in winning an intellectual debate or forcing their theology down someone else's throat and with the goal of getting them to say a sinner's prayer. And the sinner's prayer, to me, from what I'm seeing, I mean, it's a great thing to do. You know, I'm not necessarily attacking the sinner's prayer. A lot of us have said it that are listening to this podcast. But the point is, it seems like they're just trying to win this debate because then they move on to the next person. They're not discipling them. Have you noticed that? I'm reading this book, uh, God Has a Wonderful Plan for Your Life by Ray Comfort. Basically, after these people make a decision card, you know, someone comes to this intellectual assent that Jesus is Lord, over 95% of people never even like show up to church. I mean, I, I don't know if that statistic's correct, but if you read the book, you'll see that uh, he even calls them false conversions. So, one thing we need to do is uh, bring love into this equation. You know, we're building this honeycomb. Honey's involved, and we need to love. We need to work as a body. We also need to learn how to humbly, humbly disagree with others without calling them a heretic over something really minor. Here's a couple of scriptures that that come to mind here. John thirteen thirty five. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Now, was Jesus saying lip service or Lord service? Did he mean it? Are we truly loving one another? Are we willing to take our brother in as he heals from surgery while his electricity is out? Or, if not, are we qualified to attack him on Facebook and call ourselves Christians? You know, are we qualified to even call ourselves Christians? You know, if, if not, can we truly say that we love God? If, if all we're doing is bantering, you know, can we truly say that we love God? Which brings me to this verse here, 1 John 4, 20, 21. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, which reminds me of James, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So in light of this, if we're attacking our brothers and sisters through social media, do we really love God? I mean, that's what John's saying here. If we say we love our brother and we don't, do it. We hate him. You know, if we if we hate our brother, can we truly say that we love God? Now, I was cleaning the house for a long time yesterday, and I put in these Bluetooth headsets, and I listened to, you know, the Bible on you version, and I was listening to the book of Ezekiel, and this had happened the very same day I saw this Facebook post. And it's funny that this verse comes across my ears on the same day that I saw this Facebook attack rant come on. And God is only looking for one man in this verse, in Ezekiel 22.30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. There wasn't one man. And you remember this passage here? I want you to meditate on this. In Matthew 7, 12 through 7, 14, the be the few passage. Notice how it starts out. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now that's love, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? Verse 13, enter ye in at the straight gate, S-T-R-A-I-T, which does not mean like straight, like a line. It means surrounded by obstacles and difficult to enter. Enter ye in at the straight gate, 
For wide is the gate, and broad is the way which leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Matthew 7.14 says, because S-T-R-A-I-T is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So when Jesus says, there's few there be that find it, and I just read that verse in Ezekiel, he wasn't kidding. You know, God in the book of Ezekiel was looking for only one man, right? Notice it in the beginning of that passage, Jesus is talking about love. Whatsoever you would men do to you, do also unto them, right? That's love. And then he moves on that wide is the path. So, I mean, you know, if we're not, if we're not rooted in love, then that sounds like that wide path that Jesus is talking about. And Jesus' big command, you know, of course, love the Lord, but also to love one another. So as I was praying about this one man thing, and this narrow is the way, and it all has something to do with love, and love keeps us together and all that, two people came up to me in the Bible. Um, and here's one, uh, Moses, right here. He was a guy willing to stand in the gap. And listen to how serious this is, okay? In Exodus thirty two thirty, and it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure, I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, Blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. So the children of Israel, they made a golden calf. Remember, very similar things are going on in the in the congregations today. Keep in mind, Aaron the high priest, which was Moses' his brother, he's the one that did it. So we all need to have that personal relationship with Jesus. Now, Moses, even though the children of Israel, which were extremely stubborn, and they were always fighting against him, and they are always rebellious, he was willing to not just lay down his physical life, but eternal life. Dude, he knows what he was saying. Do you realize that? He truly stood in the gap. Now, that is love, right? These people were fighting Moses every step of the way, right? But just like Jesus, you know, asked the Father to forgive those that were crucifying him because they didn't know what they were doing, right? Have you ever noticed that's something to do with with sin? It's like if you truly knew what you were doing and you you saw, like, you know, we're all surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses and you're like, you know, I probably don't want to do this sin anymore. If you truly knew what you were doing. You see what I'm saying? A lot of us, my people, perish for lack of knowledge. We perish for ignorance if we truly knew what we were doing. That's why Jesus says, "If you shall know the truth, and that'll make you free. But Jesus said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then these people were fighting Moses every step of the way, and he still loved them. With that, that's a great love. He also warned that there'd be prophets rising up after him. So did Joshua. I mean, you you keep seeing this happen, and they talk about the New Testament too. This seems to be a major theme, and this is why I'm always saying, look, we can't depend on someone else. We need to depend on God personally. Now, Paul is the other person that came to mind when I was thinking about this. There's something that Paul says in Romans chapter 9 I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. I want you to read this. This is what Paul says, okay? He knows what he's talking about. He says, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Right? So Paul, the same person that was previously killing Christians, using the word of God to do so, he meets Jesus. 
Then he incessantly starts talking about following the Spirit. In fact, he even says in Romans 8, 9, those who don't have the Spirit of Christ are none of His. So we all know the passage, God is love. Okay, So if the Spirit of God dwells within us, then the Spirit of love will dwell within us, and we will show and do love to the brethren. Amen. This this echoes in my spirit about how Jesus says to Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? Let's take a look at that. When we're persecuting Christians, we are persecuting Jesus. So this knee-jerk reaction to respond to a Facebook post out of anger, we need to ask ourselves, what spirit is that of? Are we operating out of the flesh? So I'm going to say, before you type something, pray about it. If you're angry, don't press send. Right? Walk away. Pray about it. Maybe not even answer at all. We should ask ourselves, if this is the person that we're about to respond to, if they were sick and they needed a place to stay for a couple of days while their electricity was being turned on, would we take them in? To our home. Are we t- really trying to defend God with correct theology? Does God really need that? Or are we really trying to exalt our own pride? And pride is the sin of the devil. Pride comes before a fall. You know what the Lord thinks about pride. Now, I will be the first to admit that this is not a one-size-fits-all paradigm for handling each and every Facebook post by a Christian, but I think you pretty much have the spirit of the argument I'm saying here. Uh, Don't throw rocks at me by the letter. (laughs) Amen. I'm pretty sure you know what I'm talking about. So, in every post, if we're about to respond, are we truly doing it in love? Will we take that brother in? Amen. We need to ask ourselves that. God bless you. I want to thank you for being in my life. If this has touched you, please share this with your friends and family on social media. Just share the link. Comment wherever you're listening to the show. You can talk back on Voxer. Um, just let me know. I love, I'm love. i on Voxer. I'll put my link in the show notes. It's a great way to communicate. Maybe you can get in on the Christian chat. We talk about Jesus over there. Until we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comradrocks.net.